Welcome everyone again to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Series weekly discussions of practice and science by experts in behavioral health and the law. This is a weekly series hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, along with the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. I'm Anthony Perillo, the Forensic Psychology Training Director here at the Division of Forensic Behavioral Sciences here in the University of New Mexico. For our talk today, if you have any questions for our presenters, make sure you enter them in the Q&A box anytime you feel comfortable. Do know that we tend to hold questions until the end. We try to get to as many as we can, but it's, it's usually not possible to get to all of those, so just forgive us if we don't get to your questions. If you are pursuing continuing medical education credits, there will be a sign-in sheet in the chat box shortly, so keep your eye on that early on here. If you are pursuing APA continuing education credits, there will be a link also in the chat box, uh, but in the latter portions of the presentation. So keep your eye on the chat box near the end. Uh, copy that link for the CEU survey if you can't access it right now. And make sure you save your certificate after you complete your survey because we don't have access to the completed certificates after the fact. A recording link and PowerPoint slides for this talk should be available to you sometime later this week. And as a heads up for next week's talk in the series, we have Drs. Lizzie Foster and Dr. Sharon Kelly, who will be discuss having an ethics content discussion on giving feedback in forensic mental health evaluations. But let's circle back to this week. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce you to this week's presenter, who will be discussing self-regulation and sexual offense processes for understanding and treating sexual offending behavior. This is Dr. Pamela Yates. Dr. Pamela Yates is a registered forensic psychologist in private practice in Nova Scotia, Canada. She has more than 30 years experience in assessment, training, treatment, research, and program development with a specialization in assessment and treatment of individuals who have or are at risk to have committed sexual offenses. Dr. Yates's career has included work as a psychologist, as a clinical director, as a national program director for Canada's federal treatment programs. She participated and led the development of treatment programs for individuals convicted of sexual offenses has published extensively and provides training, presentations, and consultation nationally and internationally. She's written and co-authored numerous publications and is the primary author of Applying the Good Lives and Self-Regulation Models to Sexual Offender Treatment, a Practical Guide for Clinicians, and Building Better uh, Monument. She is an active member of numerous professional organizations, a longtime volunteer in her professional and personal communities, and a recipient of numerous awards. Um, Dr. Yates, Pamela, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, uh, it's an honor to have you joining our series. Uh, I'm very thrilled that you'll be sharing your expertise here with us today. Uh, I will go ahead and throw it over to you. Thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you for the uh, invitation to participate in this uh, series. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm going to talk about something I haven't spoken about uh, recently that's kind of coming back to the fore in some of my own current research. And that is uh, the relationship between uh, self-regulation and the sexual offense process. Uh, I typically spend more time in the treatment arena than the assessment arena, although I do both. Uh, so this topic, this uh, session today is going to be focused on uh, treatment implications. Um, there's the information for you on the uh, certificate of completion that um, uh, continuing education that Anthony just went through. Um, I do not have a financial interest uh, with uh, the University of New Mexico or this program uh, or through this presentation. And the views are, of course, uh, mine and they don't represent uh, University of New Mexico. Now, for the learning objectives today was uh, really to describe and develop an understanding of uh, the self-regulation model as it was specifically applied early on to the sexual offense process uh, and its relationship to treatment and the, specifically the revision of that initial model. Um, this model of the offense process gives us uh, four uh, offense pathways, we call them, more on that. And uh, by the end of the presentation, it's my hope and my plan that you'll be able to compare and contrast these four uh, uh, different offense pathways from this model. And then as will become clear, this is um, part of treatment. It's not a, an entire uh, suite of treatment. It represents just a part of a comprehensive approach. And so my hope is by the end of this uh, session today, you'll be able to take uh, these materials and apply them into your own uh, treatment planning and treatment approaches. 
Um, the treatment in terms of cons cultural considerations, we've used this model for quite a number of years in Canada, and so it has been integrated into culturally informed healing approaches and programs with Indigenous persons in conflict with the law in Canada. Um, there's been some validation with Latinx populations in the United States and some cross-jurisdictional evidence uh, base for the approach as well. Now, I'd mentioned that this is just one approach, the self-regulation piece, uh, and it's what we've been calling our uh, comprehensive approach to treatment. So I've just thrown up a, a group of, of acronyms, uh, which I will uh, explain. Uh, but as we've been doing treatment over the years and looking at different approaches that have been tried, research evidence, um, professional literature, what should we be doing in treatment, uh, these are the components that uh, we, my colleagues and I, have extracted from the literature as being um, uh, our best bet in terms of uh, effective treatment um, that leads individuals to have uh, ideally better lives and to do so without harming others. So the acronyms are... Uh, of course, the risk-need responsivity model, more popular in Canada and Commonwealth countries because it was developed in Canada, uh, gaining foothold in the U.S., but there's all sorts of research suggesting that uh, when we tailor our approach to the risk of individuals, target criminogenic needs, and tailor treatment depending on what they bring to the table, that we're more likely to have a significant treatment effect in terms of reduced recidivism. Um, the same group of individuals know that when we use social learning models, cognitive behavioral methods, skills-based approaches, we're more likely to have an impact in reducing recidivism than if we don't use these models. And those findings are uh, uh, pretty long-standing and replicated. Now, because individuals, um, we don't spend our lives um, as uh, bundles of risk, trying to manage those bundles of risk, and we're motivated by other factors. Uh, Tony Ward and his colleagues, uh, of which I've been one, uh, have been working on integrating the good lives model uh, into the treatment of individuals with sexual offenses. Uh, and I believe David Prescott did a presentation on that uh, recently. So if you've seen that, uh, or if you see that recording, definitely designed to be consistent and work with uh, the self-regulation uh, model of the offense process and where we'll be spending our time today. Um, originally developed by uh, Hudson and Ward and then uh, revised by Tony Ward and myself around 2008. If you have the opportunity to read that very dense article, it does very specifically also include the good lives model and the notion of primary human goods or common life goals uh, as being potential objectives in the sexual offense process. I won't have the opportunity to discuss that in detail today, um, but certainly can, uh, can speak to that at another time. Uh, or lead uh, direct folks to the presentation or to the publication. And then, of course, uh, one of the approaches we've used for uh, decades as important is using a motivational enhancement uh, approach. And of course, we find that individuals remain in treatment longer. And so when they remain in treatment longer, recidivism is lower. So motivational approaches are ones that we use uh, as the treating therapists. Uh, to try to motivate change to um, keep individuals uh, in treatment, uh, because the research is pretty clear that when they drop out, uh, they don't do um, don't do as well, and they reoffend at higher rates. And so, I'm going to start with an overview of the model. It will be very quick. Um, I want to focus on the definitions of the pathways. And then from there, uh, the implications of those four uh, offense pathways for the treatment process. 
And so my, my slides have a lot of words on them. Um, I don't intend to read them is the good news. Uh, wanted everyone to have as much information as you possibly could. And as much, and I'm happy to do follow up uh, at any time. So of course, this model um, of the offense process was based on self-regulation theory, uh, which of course is a whole theory of management and decision-making, uh, the internal and external processes that uh, motivate us, that help us to plan, help us engage in goal-directed actions, um, modify our behavior, evaluate our behavior, um, and that can lead to either positive or negative affect depending on the circumstance and how we might manage uh, cognitive dissonance. Uh, the self-regulation model that I'll um, be going through also looks at goal congruence. Um, you'll see that the originally this approach was adopted um, in the face of the shortcomings of the relapse prevention approach. Uh, and one of the things missing from that approach was the notion that uh, the offense can be goal congruent or it can be egocentonic. Uh, and previous models focus on uh, a deficit approach in which there's always cognitive dissonance. We'll see that that's not always the case. Um, when the original model was revised uh, to be the uh, SRM uh, revised or the SRMR, um, an additional phase was added so that um, those background and developmental factors that are so integral to uh, the patterns and the cognitive schema and the patterns of thinking that we see uh, in treatment. Um, and to be sure that those factors were included um, in treatment, helping to understand individuals where uh, various tendencies may have developed from how well entrenched a particular factor might be. So that was new to the revised model. Uh, it was also built to be consistent explicitly with risk-need responsivity, so a better fit. Um, <clears throat> the idea as well was to ensure that dynamic risk factors were explicitly considered in the offense process uh, and in the reoffense process, the consideration through treatment. Um, and as mentioned previously, to be fully integrated uh, with the good lives model. Okay. Now, um, one important distinction is that uh, the SRMR is a model of the offense progression. Uh, it's not an offender typology, so it's designed to understand uh, from the beginning to the very end and post-offense how the offense uh, plays out um, in a particular instance. And it may speak to the individual's general self-regulation tendencies, but it's not necessarily exclusively their profile with respect to self-regulation. And it's important because we have found that uh, people can follow uh, different offense processes uh, depending on the specifics. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Um, really, the focus is the, the relationship between the individual self-regulation style under offense-related conditions, their offense goals, and how they interact across the 10 phases. Seem to be having trouble advancing my slides. There we go. So these are the 10 phases. Um, I'm not going to focus on these. I, I quite literally have spent um, the better part of a day teaching in detail um, on these phases um, in situations where um, an organization is adopting a new treatment model specifically. And so what you can see are the 10 phases, um, background predisposing factors that I mentioned. Um, and some consistency with respect to the old offense cycle language in terms of uh, there's a life event that triggers some sort of uh, desire in response to that event that leads to the establishment of a goal specifically with regard to offending and a strategy to achieve that goal. And then once uh, those strategies are selected, the individual encounters an opportunity to achieve the goal engages in pre-offense behaviors, which under relapse prevention would have been called a lapse, um, and the sexual offense uh, occurs. 
And as you can see, the self-regulation model revised has uh, two post-defense phases. And these are very, very informative because they tell you about the individual's uh, evaluation of the sexual offense and the offense event, how they see it. Um, did it invoke positive or negative affect? or a combination um, of different emotional experiences? Um, how do they view it? What are their uh, intentions with respect to the future? And as we'll see, some uh, sometimes the end of the process is vowing to do better next time and not commit an offense again, or sometimes future intentions may be adjustments um, to ensure greater success, uh, depending on the individual. And that will become clear when we when we look at the offense, uh, the four offense pathways. So one of the things I really liked about this model were the two post-offense pathways. Previously in our standard uh, treatment, cognitive, behavioral, often relapse prevention based, uh, we didn't look at the reward cost contingencies uh, post-offense, um, even to determine whether or not that was a, uh, in the individual's eyes, whether that was a successful experience or an unsuccessful experience. And given that evaluation, what will they do next time? Uh, and I found those in my uh, clinical work to be uh, very, very valuable to understanding the process. Um, so there are two goals um, in self in the self regulation model. You can see that the two phases, the offense related goals and the strategies selected, form the four offense pathways. Uh, so those pathways are a combination of goal and strategy, and there are two different types of goals that are acknowledged. Uh, and the first is avoidance goals. So that's where we're trying to avoid an undesired outcome. So the focus of that is to not achieve a particular state or to prevent uh, an occurrence um, from happening. And so during that process, when the individual gains uh, information that uh, they may not be able to meet their goal, they may not be able to avoid this undesired outcome, they become anxious. They tend to become fearful that the undesired outcome might occur. Uh, emotion tends to be negative when we're dealing with avoidance goals. Uh, and we have, uh, in times of stress or pressure, the individual experiences uh, psychological distress, may experience some disinhibition, uh, self-regulation abilities may become compromised. Uh, and it's at that point that uh, individuals may abandon the goal uh, by sheer uh, being unable to maintain the effort required uh, to maintain and keep that goal. This is um, this is the characteristic of avoidance goals generally. So in the offense process, uh, what we're looking at is an individual who uh, that initial life event has some background factors that predispose them to engage in these kinds of problematic behaviors. And a life event occurs and it triggers a desire for uh, sexual behavior that the individual regards as undesired. They do not want this to occur. And then as they move through the offense process, anxiety, distress increases. And avoidance goals generally are difficult to maintain in any change behavior. Um, they require a lot of cognitive load, and they really are uh, easily abandoned in times of stress. Contrasted with approach goals, where the desire is to work towards something, so to achieve a particular state. So rather than an avoidance process, this is an appetitive process. And approach goals, um, they motivate individuals in terms of individuals anticipate the possibility of whatever the goal is, the outcome occurring. So it's a desired outcome contrasted to the avoidance goals where it's an undesired outcome. And so approach goals are generally uh, focused or associated with uh, positive emotional experiences, uh, and they're much more easily attained than avoidance goals 
and we abandon them less quickly um, in the face of stress. So we can experience uh, more psychological distress before abandoning an approach goal. Uh, and again, these are the characteristics of goals generally. So as applied to the sexual offending state, um, an individual with an approach goal in the process would be anticipating uh, the possibility of the sexual contact or the uh, sexual assault. Um, they would be looking forward to that with some measure of positive affect. Um, and if something gets in the way, they're more likely to continue to pursue it than to abandon that goal. So two very different goals in the offense process. I'll talk a bit about goals just in a minute when we talk about the pathways and we'll look at them, uh, we'll nuance them a little further. Um, self-regulation looks at, uh, this, the self-regulation model looks at the relationship between these two types of goals, avoidant and approach, and their interaction with three self-regulation styles that may be evident in the offense progression. Um, the first is an under-regulation style uh, where individuals just simply aren't sure what to do in a particular situation, so they really do very little, if anything. At best, there may be an attempt at, at distraction, uh, so I'm feeling this feeling that I don't want to feel, it's not desired. So I will think about something else, or I will call somebody, or I will somehow distract myself from that thought. And the goal then becomes the distraction, and the distraction is seen as the success. Um, however, when fending becomes, uh, when it becomes closer and closer to being imminent, um, and there's been no attempt to control behavior, uh, the individual sort of... Uh, gives in, uh, has a lot of cognitive dissonance, um, loses control, doesn't attempt to control desires, and through this under-regulation goes through the offense process, committing the offense. The second style is a misregulation style, and that's where the individual uh, does make an active attempt, but the skills or the strategies they select are not ones that are effective. Uh, and that will become clear when we look at the definitions of the pathways. So these folks are trying to exert some control, not simply distracting, but they choose the wrong skills. Um, sometimes we've heard, um, as, as we know, individuals with online offending, as we know from Michael Steto's research, you know, about half of them have hands-on, a uh, history of hands-on offending, and half of them don't. And the ones without tell us that... Um, uh, they use the online materials, the online child sexual exploitation materials, uh, as a way to prevent themselves from uh, acting out physically against a child. Some of them, when you ask qualitatively, um, do give those responses. And that would be characterized as potentially a misregulation strategy. It's an active attempt. Uh, but it's not an attempt that prevents the individual from accessing the materials. Whether it prevents them from acting out is an empirical question, and uh, we'll look to the experts in that area for the, for the answer to that. Uh, but for the purposes of the self-regulation model, uh, that would be considered an, an active attempt, um, but potentially using a strategy that that could backfire. Uh, for example, the internet will offer you additional links, and it's very easy to go down those rabbit holes, or if individuals are trying to manage uh, preferential um, uh, sexual preference, it may serve to sort of entrench acting on that preference. So as I said, it's an empirical question. For purposes of treatment, uh, we wouldn't recommend um, accessing those materials as self-regulation. So we would consider it a misregulation strategy. Now, the third one is very interesting. It's intact self-regulation. And this style um, in the work that was done for the development of this uh, self-regulation model of the offense process, um, individuals without a self-regulation deficit didn't really fit into this model. 
And if you're a treatment provider and you think about the clients you manifest, or even if you do assessment um, for your work, uh, you know that you have those individuals who didn't fit our classic relapse prevention profile, which was um, style number one, uh, where the individual presumably had a goal to refrain from offending, to avoid it, to not have it occur, and didn't really implement any strategies, came upon a high-risk situation, uh, didn't quite know what to do, or may have attempted some minimal strategy, and then uh, relapsed, lapsed and relapsed, uh, you know, almost by by accident. Um, but there were those folks, and they still do challenge our, our treatment, who will tell you, you know, no, it was intentional. I planned it. I collected the materials. Um, and it's part of, um, it's, it's goal congruent, and it's egocentric. And so those individuals didn't fit with our previous uh, models before. Uh, they're difficult um, to cope with, to, to manage and treatment, but they're, um, they're different from previous ones. So treatment should be getting a little bit easier if we uh, do it differently. So in self-regulation math, we have the uh, two types of goals, which you can see. You'll see that the pathways are each uh, a word pair. The first word is the goal, and the second word is the strategy. And so in self-regulation math, two goals by three strategies equals four pathways. Um, and that's just how it worked out. Um, so I'm going to talk about each of these um, uh, individually. So the first two are based on avoidance goals, uh, and the second two pathways are based on approach goals. And then we have passive or automatic type strategies and then more active strategies. And so looking at the avoidant passive pathway, it's a, an under-regulation pathway with an avoidance goal. So these are the individuals who want to refrain from offending. We have reason to believe that is the, the, the case with them. And as the offense process starts, we have the life event, the opportunities to achieve goals, uh, whether they're common life, good lives goals or offense related goals. The individual moves further down uh, the progression to offending. Uh, there's a signal that, hey, there's some opportunities here now. The goal is activated and then the strategy to prevent offending is then activated. But because this individual is following an under-regulation pathway, uh, most, the most active strategy they follow is a distraction strategy. So those are the individuals, as I said, who might try to think about something else. Um, those are individuals who may just go into denial. There's no problem here. I'm not having any urges. Um, we humans use denial because it works. Uh, it helps us to kind of ignore the problem that we're not really quite able to cope with or we're not sure how to deal with. So then the offense process is they don't really have the skills or the capacity in spite of the desire to prevent offending. As mentioned, the desire to offend emerges and they start to experience uh, some loss of control. By the time the pre-offense phase, the individual gets to the pre-offense phase, the avoidance goal has been abandoned. There's a big cognitive load, a lot of efforts being expended to maintain the goal, and well as, for example, to maintain the denial that there's a problem. Uh, there's not really a lot of planning. Um, if there is, it's more um, overt as opposed to overtly planning the steps in the process. And typically, there's negative emotional reactions. And when we look at those post-offense phases, the individual's more likely to report uh, negative emotions, uh, greater anxiety. They're more likely to report uh, that they were a failure, a goal failure, um, that the offense experience was a failure experience for them post-offense. And these folks will often see that they will resolve that next time this won't happen again. So they sort of renew the avoidance goal. Um, so they're keeping that entrenched. My goal is still not to harm a child. I still don't believe this is okay. 
Um, and so next time I'm going to make sure it doesn't happen. The issue is without intervention, of course, without treatment, um, the individual doesn't learn new skills and then that progression can repeat itself. So that's the first pathway, the avoidant passive pathway. So an avoidant goal and passive or under-regulated uh, self-regulation in achieving that goal, resulting in goal failure and generally uh, the occurrence of an undesired outcome. Looking at the next pathway, the avoidant active pathway. So the goal is the same. So all of that's the same. The issue is the, is the uh, misregulation strategy. And so this individual has, you know, maybe some more awareness or this individual in this offense progression will have some more awareness of the offense process and what's happening uh, because they actually do try to implement strategies. Uh, but those strategies are not effective, and in some cases, they can actually increase risk. Uh, so it could be that uh, paraphilic individuals who avail themselves of online child sexual, sexual exploitation materials, CSAM or CSAM, um, they may access these materials, um, but those materials may reinforce the relationship, a sexual relationship between adults and children in their mind. And if so, then that strategy could potentially increase risk should the individual come to have lots of schema and distortions about that. Um, this is an acceptable thing. It's online. These children must be participating. You've heard all of the distortions. You don't need them uh, from me. And so those types of self-talk can, can lead to iatrogenic effects. Another example is um, uh, folks trying to regulate mood. And we know, for example, one of the dynamic risk factors is uh, the use of sexual behavior of some kind to cope with negative emotions, negative states, um, and so forth. And the individual may use alcohol. Um, in Canada, about four years ago, uh, cannabis became legal uh, as a recreational drug. I know it is in some US states as well. And so it's uh, interesting to see how uh, cannabis is being used in, in addition to alcohol uh, previously, now it might be either. So the individual is using alcohol to cope with negative mood states, or the individual is using something like cannabis to uh, modulate and regulate mood. Um, of course, that doesn't resolve the issue, can lead to avoidance uh, and strategies that aren't effective, and that ultimately may worsen mood and worsen coping. Um, the offense process. They have some self-regulation capacity, but these process, the individuals are not aware that the strategies aren't effective. So as you can see, you can start to see some of the implications for uh, for treatment that are evolved from these offense uh, pathways. Again, because it's an avoidance goal, the individual um, tends to abandon that goal at the pre-offense phase, changes to an approach goal. And again, if there's any planning, it's it's not overt planning. Uh, it's that more subtle or subconscious planning. The individual may not even be um, consciously aware in that moment. And like the other avoidant pathway <clears throat> is associated with predominantly negative emotional experiences, anxiety, uh, a post-offense evaluation as, as a failure rather than a success. And again, a renewal to just try those strategies a little bit harder should this situation happen next time. So you can see the similarities between those two pathways with really the difference being the types of strategies the individual chooses within uh, the specific pathway, whether that's just sort of passive or underregulated, or whether the individual is at more actively trying to manage the issue. First is now when we look at, oops, I skipped one, excuse me, when we look at the approach to approach pathways. Uh, so in this, these two pathways, 
uh, the goal is different. The, the goal is antisocial. It's offense supportive. Um, the individual would be verbalizing the distortions, uh, indicating that um, sexual behavior in this instance is fully appropriate. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's all sorts of distortions that people can use to convince themselves of that. Uh, but either way, they anticipate uh, the outcome. A really good example, actually, I'll look at the strategies first. For, for these, uh, the approach automatic pathway. So this is another under-regulation pathway. Uh, there was the avoidant passive was under-regulated with an avoidant goal. Now this is approach automatic, an under-regulation pathway but with a goal that's uh, supportive of progressing through the offense process. And the self-regulation strategies here <clears throat> may be impulsive. That's often what people first think of with the uh, approach automatic phase. So things happen kind of quickly. The offense process rolls out fairly quickly, and it appears quite impulsive. Um, you know, these are the individuals when I was doing assessment, I would say they were the ones who told me, I don't know what happened. I went out to meet some friends at the pub. And the next thing you knew, I woke up in jail the next morning charged with a sexual offense. Um, and then everything's gone so quickly and the steps have played out really, uh, really quickly in the offense process. The piece to keep in mind about this, uh, this offense pathway is that it's also an opportunistic one. So in either case, it's, it's activated by cues in the situation. So the individual may not set out to engage in a sexual offense or to uh, start behaviors uh, that lead to the offense process. They may set out a certain way, they're cued by the situation and they decide to turn their attention uh, to where, where that cue takes them. And they may see an opportunity to get their needs met. Um, an example may here may be an individual who I uh, spoke about someone going to the pub. So an individual who goes to the pub, has too much to drink, hasn't really had any plans other than to go out and have fun with his friends, uh, ends up uh, being rejected uh, by somebody he's approached at the night. Let's say he's approached a, a woman and the woman rejects him. Um, and what that does is it triggers entrenched scripts or schema um, that then the individual reacts to. So if the individual has a, um, a hostility toward women uh, as a schema in that situation, that schema could be triggered. And then um, goals with respect to that situation are established. For example, um, I'm going to show this person they can't disrespect me, uh, you, they can't lead me on and then not put out, whatever the case may be. So that becomes the goal, and then the strategies are developed um, to achieve that goal. So the offense process in this instance is it may be associated with positive affect, just either um, achievement of, a, of an anticipated state or alleviating a negative state. So if an individual such as the one I just described uh, um, experienced anger in that situation, then relieving the anger um, would be uh, associated with positive affect or showing someone I, I've shown them you know, that it's important to respect me. And then future goals, the individuals um, are not renewing an avoidance goal. They may look at their behavior and say, well, that was a little bit uh, not according to plan. I, I may change it up so I'll be uh, more successful next time. But that could be, uh, I was almost caught. So next time, if it happens again, I will do X, Y, Z to reduce the possibility um, that I will be, uh, I'll be seen for this. One of the interesting pieces um, we found with this research, and Dennis Dorn and I did a qualitative piece and then followed up, the reference should be here, it was uh, Katie Gotch and her group. Uh, we found that um, Dennis Dorn and I predicted that most people who achieve the cutoff for psychopathy 
would fall into this pathway. And others' uh, hypothesis was that it would fall into the next one, the approach explicit, which is very much the planned um, offense process. Um, but with the tendency for individuals with psychopathy to be opportunistic, uh, Doran and I expected that the majority of psychopathic individuals would fall into this um, type of offense pathway. And Katie Gotch actually replicated that uh, with data. So we do find that this is the pathway associated. I think in her study, about 75% of those uh, with psychopathy uh, fell into this pathway. So that's really interesting and sometimes a bit counterintuitive. I'll talk about the risk piece as well in just a minute. So for the approach explicit pathway, again, the offense supportive goal, working toward achieving a desired state or outcome, but the strategies are explicit, they're conscious, this is uh, more overtly planned. Um, so this would be the individuals who um, live in certain areas uh, because they know that single women of a certain single professional women are regularly walking the neighborhood, uh, walking their dogs, or um, this in, this type of process may be uh, overtly grooming <clears throat> a child uh, to become comfortable so that then the uh, individual can engage in the sexual offending conduct. So again, in this um, pathway, uh, the goal is, is congruent um, with their attitudes, with what they believe. There's generally positive affect um, and a positive evaluation of their behavior post-defense. When speaking about risk, you can see there have been a couple of studies, and there's there's a good research base that um, we've written it up a few times. If anyone is interested, we, I'm certainly happy to share. What we find is that um, higher risk levels are associated with the approach pathways than with the avoidant pathways. That seems intuitive, but it wasn't obvious at first. Um, and what we find are um, the approach automatic pathway is more likely to be associated uh, with more sort of general criminality or tendency to violence, where the approach explicit pathway uh, tends to be a higher risk. It also is associated with higher risk and more with a specialist pathway. So you can start to see the uh, additional information you gain by looking at offense pathway in the offense progression. And so, of course, what do we do about that? So just a couple of minutes, I obviously can't run through a comprehensive approach, but a couple of minutes on how would we do things a little bit differently depending on, on the pathway followed. And just for our reminder that this is just a small part of the offense uh, approach. And so this is designed to be used in conjunction with risk need responsivity, cognitive behavioral methods. It fits very well with um, the good lives model. That's about the goals the individuals are trying to achieve in their sort of day to day lives and as part of their life plan. And sometimes those goals are also in the offense process. So the individual is trying to meet a common life goal or a good life goal of uh, having relationships or feeling intimacy. Using the self-regulation approach, we can say that, you know, we can reinforce the goal and maybe even the efforts um, but not the ways that they went about it. So the goal might not be problematic at all. The individual may not want to act out in an offending way, um, but how they go about it is the issue. And then we're always using those uh, motivational approaches. <clears throat> and uh, I defer, as many do, to David Prescott for the motivational enhancement approaches, um, uh, because he's as figuratively and literally written uh, written the book on those. Uh, and I'd be remiss also not to um, uh, not to acknowledge uh, Jill Stinson as well. And she's written recent uh, done some specific work on motivational interviewing, uh, which is an excellent read as well. 
And so why bother with any of this at all? Well, to guide our treatment. That's that's why we do assessment. Um, so we know going in uh, dynamic risk factors or DRFs, as I have them uh, on the screen, uh, we can look at the relationship between the way the individual self-regulates in the offense process and how they regulate in everyday life and what is the relationship to offending behavior, to life problems. If we're taking a good lives model approach, we're also um, uh, aiming through treatment to help the individual, you know, have a better life going forward. And obviously one that involves not offending. We could potentially get information on how they achieve other goals um, and their general self-regulation capacity. And so what differs and what I put in red are like some examples of what you might already be doing in treatment. If you're putting your mind to planning, how might you integrate this? Um, so with the avoidant pathways, we want to reinforce that avoidance goal. And for my part, I do that anyway, whether I believe the individual or not, if they say to me, I don't want to do this again, I'm all over that with positive reinforcement because we know that the way to get behavior to increase is to reinforce it. <clears throat> and my hope is that through motivational interviewing, some good lives models, that I can encourage the person to really adopt that as a goal if it isn't theirs. Um, but if you're working with someone who has an avoidance goal and they're saying to you, I don't want to do this the game, I consider that to be a really good starting point with lots of reinforcement. I don't have to develop that with them. And so with that, when we do psychoeducation, well, this, this is the, the person who's gone through the offense pathway kind of oblivious to it. So we want to help them increase their understanding of and whether you use our 10 phase model or your own six phase model, this is how it happens. And this is where some skills can be used early on. This is a problem that can be dealt with in advance to prevent that. So you can do a lot of awareness raising and skill development, even before the actual offense phase, which is like phase seven of, of the 10 phases. You want to understand the development of um, their style of self-regulation and capacity and where did that come from for him and, and for them and what were their skills. And so, for example, that can be done. Many folks do an autobiography as part of treatment. So that can be included. You know, what was your self-regulation like as, as a child? And that's the phase one of the self-regulation model. <clears throat> we can look at the relationship to offending and so forth. And, and I've put there as offense disclosure as an example of, again, a, a common treatment activity that can include, that this model can, can fit nicely with. And then really sort of the, the punchline for treatment is, you know, developing those effective skills and strategies um, to identify risk, first of all, because they really didn't identify it before. If they did, they didn't pay attention to it. Identify capacity to cope, maybe increase uh, confidence in their ability to cope or uh, expectancies of, of a successful outcome. Um, motivation to manage risk, that they're able to manage it, they're able to generate strategies, um, they're able to manage problems and, and attain their life goals. And again, for each of these will be case specific on the examples. Um, but if this is an individual, say somebody who's a, a non-preferential, uh, an individual with non-preferential pedophilia, then we would be working toward healthy relationships. We would help them understand what happens, why these desires emerge, why it leads to certain offending process, and how they can manage things over the short term and ultimately the long term uh, to meet the goal of not acting out against a child as an example of what this would look like. And so very similarly for the avoidant active approach, but again, the difference is we want to reinforce making an effort. In this case, their strategies didn't achieve their goal of avoiding, and their strategies may have sort of backfired and led to some increased risk, but they made an effort. So we want to really reinforce that effort. You've noticed that something wasn't going according to plan, that something risky was happening. 
And you notice it so much that you made efforts to try to prevent that outcome from happening. And so the psychoeducation, awareness raising and so forth are all around um, how can we uh, increase your repertoire of strategies and really inculcating strategies um, that are more effective than the current repertoire the individual has and to reduce the reliance on those ineffective strategies. So those are kind of the two big main differences between those two pathways is in the area of strategies. So when we get to the um, approach pathways, um, really what we need to do then is, is start some of those good motivational approaches that folks like David and Jill advocate uh, to increase people's motivation to live an offense-free life. Um, if someone tends to be fairly narcissistic, well, then what would motivate them to do differently, you know, for their own sake, if not for others, if they're not capable of that uh, uh, looking outward or that empathy? And somewhere in there, we have to have them abandon that offense supportive goal. So that would be where we would be changing those cognitive schema, or as um, Tony Ward uh, looked at, those implicit theories that individuals with sexual offenses specifically hold. So this is when we're getting into maybe some longer term treatment, some schema therapy type treatment to change the belief that this is okay. And therefore to uh, change that goal when it comes to the offense process. Because this individual, this situation is activated by cues or opportunity, we also want to reduce impulsivity or the tendency to rely on overlearned scripts, whichever is the case. So when I see this, I do this. We want to break that association in time and have a new association with a pro-social non-offending impulse or behavior. So we're looking at both uh, here with the approach uh, automatic pathway, as well as um, increasing you know, their idea of metacognition, right? Knowing when there could be a problem and being able to think about that in advance and say prevent an offense process from even occurring. We also want to work on strategies to maintain, or sorry, to attain pro-social desired goals. So if they're um, seeking relationship or seeking sexual pleasure through the offense process, how can they achieve that in a way that's not harmful to others? And because of this dual problematic goal, problematic self-regulation, uh, and now knowing that it's correlated with higher risk and from one of our studies, higher reoffense rates, um, we know that external monitoring is going to be a need for these folks more so than the avoidant goal pathway folks. And then finally, you can kind of see the pattern here with the approach explicit. We don't have a self-regulation deficit. So really, we're looking at uh, those schema, those overlearned scripts, uh, that opportunism that's very well entrenched. And similar, similarly with the other offense uh, approach pathway, increasing motivation to not offend, to live life offense free and redirect goals and attain um, non-harmful goals in non-harmful ways. And because these folks sort of don't have deficits per se in coping. Uh, the deficit is in their goal. Uh, these folks can be a little bit more challenging for us. And uh, from what we see, they, they we recommend at this time, you know, some more uh, supervision, external monitoring. So again, as compared to lower risk folks or the avoidant pathways, um, you'd want to increase monitoring when that individual is, is in the community. And I think uh, just to sort of have the conclusions, um, this is part of, of a whole comprehensive part of treatment that's been developed by my group and others over the last couple of decades. Um, we're all working toward an evidence-based practice, um, and this is designed to be an evidence-based understanding of uh, the role of self-regulation in the progression to sexual offending. 
Um, and as mentioned, it's designed to inform uh, both assessment and treatment planning so that we can meet the risk need responsivity model, which is to tailor our work depending on those factors uh, the individual presents with. And so this is um, the self-regulation contribution that we've been making to that model. And I think, and then I have the references and there are uh, many other um, references available and presentations, I'm happy to share them. Uh, if anybody wants them. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yates, Pamela. Uh, first of all, for just the pure amount of contributions you have done in this area for, for over the years, um, the connection between theory and practice, and then navigating us through all of this, how to better understand and how that would actually translate to better treatment and intervention approaches. It's really much appreciated. Um, we have a number of questions uh, already. Uh, hey. If you if you f have any additional questions, feel free to enter them into the Q&A box. Make sure that you check the survey link if you're pursuing continuing education credits. Those links do work, but if for whatever reason it's not working for you now, make sure to copy and bookmark that for later. It should work in your browser at some, some point. Um, Somebody with the caveat that they apologize, they joined late uh, talking about this, these different discussions between relapse prevention and the good lives model. Uh, what are your thoughts of using relapse prevention model alongside the good lives model? I know you've, you've, you've discussed this, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe, I mean, the relapse prevention model made such a huge contribution to the field, right? I mean, it really was the original model. Um, it seemed to be working, you know, it was an evidence based practice with substance use uh, or misuse, right, developed when folks were going into detox and they found that people were successfully abstaining. But once they went to the community, they were relapsing. And so how do we prevent that? And if you look at the pathways, that first avoidant passive pathway, um, I think I developed my first relapse prevention program probably before some folks here were born even. I think it was like 88 or 89 or somewhere in that zone. And uh, uh, it really was great for kind of that first pathway. But then as soon as someone sits in front of us and says, well, I did it, I meant to do it, and I like it. There's not really a relapse to present. And, you know, there are some differences between, you know, the medical model and the substance use model and addiction and so forth and, and sexual offending. And some of the constructs just didn't really fit. So, so what's a lapse in a sexual offense process? You know, for a hands-on offender, is that just looking at online materials instead of in person, or is it partly intrusive, but not fully intrusive as fits the sexual assault, like the kind of uh, don't really fit some of the concepts. And it doesn't fit for those who hold offense supportive goals. So I really like to look at this as I, I know that my history is, is I've, I've beaten up the relapse prevention model quite a bit. Um, certainly it, it's made the contribution. And I think without it, we wouldn't have been able to build this. And I think this just gives us like three more pathways than, than relapse prevention did. Wonderful. And I can confirm with the trainees and ECPs on the chat right now, some, uh, the r, &R model does predate uh, the existence of some of the people that are listening in right now, uh, certainly. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. How, how cleanly, uh, or how often do people seem to cleanly fit some of these pathways and how does that have implications for treatment, whether or not it's multiple offenses with different victims or even repeated offending with the same victim that seems to serve different purposes? How does that, how often does that seem to come up and how does that factor into mm -hmm. how we then carry out intervention in this model? Right. Yeah. One of the ways that comes up the most is um, the approach automatic pathway. So that's the person with the antisocial goal, and then they're sort of cued by the situation. So if you think about impulsive people generally, and maybe kind of the example I gave where you know, the person goes into one situation and they don't sort of 
plan where they end up by the end of the end of the day or the end of the hour, but that's where they end up. And then they do it again and again and again and again. You know, it's like, is the individual who consumes excessive substances and then goes out and commits a sexual assault, is it still avoidant? Uh, is it still approach automatic? if they know that every time they consume too many substances, they will commit a sexual assault. So that's where it can get a little sticky and where you see that repeat of the same pattern. Um, I want to assess, is, is it really that the individual hasn't clued into their impulsivity or their tendency to be opportunistic, or are they being more explicit? So that's one of the places clinically we do see it. The other place clinically where we see it is the avoidant active phase, um, the avoidant active pathway. It's kind of hard to see because when we look at documentation, police reports, when we do our interviews, we're looking at what, what strategies brought you closer to the offense process, not what did you try to do to prevent it. So we don't tend to collect the information. So the frequency of that pathway comes out a little bit quite lower. I think in the end, if it's going to be mixed up, it's going to be mixed up with the other avoidant pass, avoidant pathway, the passive one. And they're similar in treatment that I don't think it's going to be harmful either way if that gets a bit missed. Now, I do know one early, early study on, done by uh, Stephen Webster in the UK um, he found that pathway did not change. So that was the other interesting thing. He looked yeah. at recidivists, and in his sample, all but one followed an approach pathway. Uh, the one pathway that couldn't be characterized, it, it didn't fall neatly anywhere. Uh, and that's where all of his recidivists had that pathway except that one. So um, that's that's another piece that we're starting to see Um we don't know if pathway changes. Um, when we talk about changing that offense related goal for the first two pathways, uh, you know, we're hope th hopeful through good motivational strategies and the good lives model to engage the person enough with that type of lifestyle that they would consider desisting. Thank you. And spe speaking of motivation, somebody asked uh, about clarification of how the level of motivation in the treatment model is assessed or addressed. Is, is motivation a criteria for even inclusion in treatment under the model? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I just, what I put there is over the years, um, just in all of the different work that we've done, what we see to be a comprehensive approach. So if you think about folks like the folks that, um, the work that folks like David has done on motivation, right? It's, it's how to use that in the assessment process. I'm using it in terms of how to use it in the treatment process to maximize one, attendance, and two, um, success and reduced uh, reoffending. A little plug for the Good Lives model. We, so we know, like all the studies Carl Hansen and the others have done, we know that when people drop out of treatment, they reoffend at higher rates than if they don't drop out. And that's a clear indicator across the board. So now it becomes, what do we do to keep them in treatment? So we use the motivational approaches um, Tony and his colleagues came up with the good lives model to create, you know, more motivation, right? This is also for you to have a decent life, not just manage risk. And the research shows that those folks stay in treatment. Um, uh, I'm getting older and the name, her name just escaped me. It will come to me. We've worked together. Dominique Simons. She actually compared um, a good lives self-regulation approach when they switch to it with their classic relapse prevention approach from before they switched. So complete cohort model. And they had far fewer dropouts than they had ever had in their program. So if, if layering in the self-regulation model to make the understanding of the offense process more relevant and personalized, the idea is that contributes even more. And I'm going for 100% completion and 0% dropout with, with yeah. those uh, kinds of research. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Um, on, on the assessment side there, someone said, with, with regard to assessment measures that capture risk factors across these offense pathways, such as the STABLE 2007, the BRSSO, do you think an individual's risk is adequately captured if it's true that offenders with approach goals tend to have higher risk for sexual recidivism? Yes. 
Because I had to I had to calculate that you had multiple Certainly. multiple clauses there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think these are mechanisms. I mean, through which the dynamic risk factors are processed and. We saw what we're seeing in the research is a contribution of this over and above the contribution of the dynamic risk factor. So it does seem to be adding variance. Someone asked if there are special considerations explicitly addressed in the model uh, for native offenders. Mm -hmm. The the um, the view we've gotten back now again we did sort of launch it with uh, a good lives uh, focus and we did that because again indigenous offenders were the ones dropping out at the highest rates because the mainstream programs simply didn't resonate so as part of a whole sort of cultural shift we built this into the program and it's the feedback we got from that community was that it much more closely approximates the healing approach that we're using uh, with the Indigenous community. It's much more um, taking into account, account their own personal and social history. Um, we talk about uh, we talk about social history here in Canada a lot and the impact of an individual's you know, colonization and genocide and their own social and cultural history on where they are today. And we're told that there's room for that in this model uh, versus the, the models we had before were more rigid or more rigidly applied and there was less room for that. Wonderful. Thank you for that clarification there. Uh, someone had a question about how well the model seems to apply for offenses um, on adults versus offenses against children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have noticed uh, a difference in how the model applies. Um, it does seem that certain uh, types of offenders are loading onto certain pathways. So um, uh, what we call a mixed offender um, or a uh, polymorphous offender, I think to use uh, Sky Stevens terminology, um, when we have a polymorphous individual, they're more likely to have been, at least in the research so far, in the approach explicit pathway. So we find different loadings, but the model itself seems to apply to all. Excellent. Thank you for that. A uh, final question to wrap up here. Somebody noted years ago, uh, Tony Ward had published an article presenting the approach avoidance and active passive measures implicit in the good lives model, and that this article included an addendum with Likert scaled measures of the dimensions. And he was curious, have you established standardized checklists that are used as assessment or progress measures? We have, in fact, we developed them in about 2007. They still exist. Um, they've been published. They've been shelved. I've bought them, so I now own them and can give them away freely. Uh, but we actually have full assessment for uh, the primary human goods or the common life goals and their relationship to the offense process. And how you would, how do you code? We have a coding manual for avoidant goals and active goals and the different strategies and an algorithm to create uh, the pathway. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Pamela, Dr. Yates, for again, for everything, all of your contributions in this area and then helping us uh, understand everything from pathways and how that would impact assessments and then how that would uh, impact intervention. Your contributions here have been uh, exceptional and I'm very thankful for having you joining the series for us. Oh, well, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. I, I love that there's interest in this. Uh, as you can see, I get fairly excited with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, just part of really doing this work. So I was pleased to be invited. Wonderful. That, that wraps up this week's Lawn Mental Health series. We hope to see you next week when Drs. Leslie Foster and Sharon Kelly will have an ethics-based discussion on practice and ethical considerations of giving feedback during a mental health evaluation, a forensic mental health evaluation. Until then, uh, we hope to see you next week and have a fantastic rest of the week and take care. <laughs>